The same narration comes with different wordings. In some narrations, the Prophet ﷺ, instead of saying that whoever believes in Allah in the Day of Judgment, فَلْيُكْرِمْ جَارَهُ That he should honor his guest, honor his neighbor, as this narration mentions. In another narration, instead of saying, فَلْيُكْرِمْ جَارَهُ It says, it says فَلَا يُؤْذِي جَارَهُ That he shouldn't harm his neighbor. In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ said, فَلْيُحْسِنْ قِرَاضَيْ فِيهِ In one narration, the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ فَلْيَصِلْ رَحِمَهُ That he should join bonds and join ties with those that he has narrated. And there are other narrations too, uh, in which the Prophet ﷺ tells us that whoever believes in Allah in the Day of Judgment should not do X, Y, and Z, or should do X, Y, and Z. I have compiled some of those narrations and I'll share them with you inshallah at the end of the class. That'll be the last thing we'll do before we close off today's class, we'll share those narrations. I've quoted this before, but just for refreshing our memory, the great scholar Abu Muhammad Abdullah bin Abi Zaid, um, the Imam of the Malikiyah in the Maghrib, he said that the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ can be summarized to four hadith when it comes to the source of etiquettes. If you want to study etiquettes from the Prophet's teachings, there are four narrations you need to focus on. And out of these four narrations is the narration that we're studying here. He quotes this particular narration where the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَلْيَقُلْ خَيْرًا أَوْ لِيَسْمُتْ فَلْيُكْرِمْ جَارَهُ فَلْيُكْرِمْ ضَيْفَهُ As we just translated. And the second hadith he quoted, which we also have already covered, مِنْ حُسْنِ إِسْلَامِ الْمَرْءِ تَرْكُهُ مَا لَا يَعْنِي From the beauty of a person's faith is that he leaves that which does not concern him. And then the statement of the Prophet ﷺ to his companion. And this narration we haven't covered yet, but we'll be covering it soon. لا تغضب, do not become angry. And then the fourth narration, the Prophet ﷺ said, and we've already covered this narration as well. لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه. You will not be a complete believer until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. Now this, we note that the, the acts in our religion, the deeds that we are told to uh, engage in in our religion fall in one of two categories. حقوق الله and حقوق العباد. This hadith focuses mainly on حقوق العباد. The focus in this hadith is predominantly on the fulfilling the right people. That's why if I were to title this narration, I would title it as Manners in Islam, Social Etiquette in Islam, How to Take Care of the People Around You, uh, What Rights That You Have Towards the People. And very eloquently, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he lists out three things, and these three things then open up like a spider web, and they bring so many other issues underneath them. Um, the famous scholar at Tufi, he said that the reason why when the Prophet ﷺ says, مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهُ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرُ Whoever believes in Allah on the Day of Judgment should do X, Y, and Z. He said, when you read that statement, it's important that you understand that by not doing that thing, you don't literally lose your faith. If a person doesn't take care of their guests, does that mean they're no longer a Muslim? That they're disbelievers? Not at all. Rather, what this hadith is trying to say, rather than teaching us how to make people kafir, how to push people out of the folds of Islam, that's not what our religion is teaching us. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is showing us that these are attributes of believers. These are things they should surely do. A, com a complete believer, someone who wishes to excel in his or her faith, will do whatever it takes to include these acts into their life. Man kana yu'minu billah wal yawmil akhir. Or, the translation could be, Whoever believes in Allah and the Day of Judgment, it doesn't suit that person that they do X, Y, and Z. That it's not suitable for someone who believes in Allah and the Day of Judgment that they engage in, in these actions. Now there's a question, why did the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him restrict himself to these two things? مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ The Prophet of Allah could have said, مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ that whoever believes in Allah and His Messenger, and whoever believes in the Book of Allah, and whoever believes in angels, he could have said all of those things. But why does the Prophet of Allah specifically say, whoever believes in Allah and the Day of Judgment? Why these two things? Why not the others? So the scholars have engaged in a lengthy discussion on why. And I'll share two, three reasons with you. The first thing they say, مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ The reason why the Prophet says whoever believes in Allah 
is because believing in Allah is the foundation of your faith. Without it, there is nothing. From it, other beliefs, the other tenets take birth. The foundation, the asas, asas, it's the foundation. As for the judgment, the reason why that's mentioned is because where this is the foundation, everything that's built upon this foundation now, you will be accountable for it on Wal Yom Al Akhir, on the Day of Judgment. So if your foundation is strong, you will focus on delivering good deeds. So the last part of the, of, of the statement, whoever believes in Allah and the Day of Judgment, and the Day of Judgment is reminding us that you have to meet Allah. Your return is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you're looking for a good way to prepare yourself, these are certain things that you need to bring into your life. Another group of scholars, they say, مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ The reason why these two things are mentioned is to remind us of the beginning and end of our journey. The beginning of your journey is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you. And the end of your journey is you standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your book of deeds being given in your right or left hand. Some scholars say that this statement, مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ Believing in Allah and the Day of Judgment, the Prophet mentioning these two as a condition. It's a perfect balance between الْإِيمَانُ بَيْنَ الْخَوْفِ raja. That the perfect faith is a balance between love and fear, a hope and fear. Because when the Prophet says, مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ Whoever believes in Allah, believing in Allah entails hope, it entails mercy. Because we know that our Creator, our Master, our Lord, our Allah is merciful. He loves the creation more than a mother can ever dream of loving her child. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's loving of you starts way before you even knew that you would come into existence. And it will last much beyond after you leave this world and you will see its true manifestation in the hereafter. That's the love of God. Anyone that tells you that your Lord hates you or your Lord is angry at you doesn't understand how intimate your relationship is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Obviously, if you do things that call on the anger of Allah, then you are accountable for that. But if a person sincerely in their heart repents to Allah no matter what the sin is, even if it is holding partners of Allah, even if a person has a faulty belief, but, they, but then they repent from that faulty belief, will Allah forgive them? Most definitely. There is no doubt in it at all. To doubt the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in itself is a form of disbelief. فَإِنَّهُ لَا يَيْأَسُ مِنْ رَوْحِ اللَّهِ إِلَّا الْقَوْمِ الْكَافِرُونَ Because only those people are despondent of the mercy of Allah who are, who are not true believers. إِلَّا الْقَوْمِ الْكَافِرُونَ The people who are not believers. And the day of judgment, that takes us to a place of fear. Being held accountable. Our deeds being brought forth. Imagine being forced to read through your Facebook feed over the last eight years, everything you wrote for eight years, starting with 2000 and you know, right at the end, 2009. You'd be ashamed of yourself. I can't believe I wrote this in 2009. I was such an idiot. I was a moron. Or reading something that you wrote in 2007. I can't believe I wrote this 10 years ago. We would be ashamed of reading our tweets. And these are thoughts that we have constructed to be read by the public, not personal, not our private thoughts. And the day of judgment is about hope, it's about rah, it's about being uh, terrified of facing your own actions. So, man kana yu'minu billah wal yawm al-akhir, whoever has a balance between these two, understands the mercy of Allah, and also understands responsibility and accountability on the day of judgment, he should do X, Y, and Z. Now, the three things the Prophet ﷺ lists in this hadith are very powerful. The first thing he says is, فَلْيَقُلْ خَيْرًا أَوْ لِيَصْمُتْ Speak good or remain silent. There is a hadith that can be found in Al-Musnad from Anas bin Malik radiallahu an. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لَا يَسْتَقِيمُ إِيمَانُ عَبْدٍ حَتَّى يَسْتَقِيمَ قَلْبُهُ وَلَا يَسْتَقِيمَ قَلْبُهُ حَتَّى يَسْتَقِيمَ لِسَانَهُ A person's faith cannot be firm in their heart Sorry, a person's faith cannot be firm until their heart is firm. Until their heart is strong and straight. Your faith can't be complete. That's why you will constantly be reminded that your faith is in your heart. You need to work on your internal affairs. You need to work on your heart. Develop your spirituality. Clean your heart. 
Every day make dua to Allah, Ya Allah, give me a heart that's clean, Ya Allah, give me a heart that's sincere, because that's the mahal, that's the station of faith. You cannot have complete faith until your heart is straight and it's clean and it's proper. And the person's وَلَا يَسْتَقِيمُ قَلْبُهُ And his heart cannot be firm and straight حَتَّى يَسْتَقِيمَ لِسَانُهُ Until his tongue becomes firm and straight. Imam al-Ghazali rahmatullahi alayhi The great Hujjatul Islam He talks about the diseases of the tongue in length. Not in one of his books, but in many of his Not just in one particular book, but in many of his books. Starting with his famous Ihya Ulum al-Din. If anyone wants to do a detailed class or like a, a proper study on the diseases of the tongue, the best place I would recommend you to go to is Imam Ghazali's Ihya ul Imam Ghazali divided that book, Ihya ul into four parts. Rubu' al-Ibadat, that's the first part. Then after that he goes into uh, the different quarters, Rubu' al-Munjiyat, the things that will save a person. And then a quarter that relates to Rubu' al-Muhlikat, the quarter that will destroy a person. The, the quarter of the book that relates to things will destroy a person. So Imam Ghazali talks about things you need to be careful of. Now, I'm in the Rubu' al-Muhlikat, within the fourth of the book that Imam Ghazali talks about, those things that will destroy your world and, it, and, this, and your success in it, and that will destroy your hereafter. He has a chapter, it's called Babu Afat al-Lisan. The chapter on the harms or the diseases of the tongue. Many years ago, I had the honor of teaching this particular chapter. But unfortunately, I don't think it was recorded. Maybe someday I'd like to cover it again because it's so relevant, it's so real. And in that chapter, he covers 20 diseases of the tongue. Two zero. Two zero. That particular chapter has been published as a separate book as well, translated in English. Then Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi alayhi in his Bidayatul Hidayah at the beginning of guidance which is like a, an, an ultra summary of the Ihya ulum din In there, rather than covering 20, he brings 8 diseases of the tongue. And the way he constructs his discussion is so beautiful. He says, قَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَىٰ الْيَوْمَ نَخْتِمُ عَلَىٰ أَفْوَاهِهِمْ وَتُكَلِّمُنَا أَيْدِيهِمْ وَتَشْهَدُ أَرْجُلُهُمْ بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ that on that day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will seal the mouth. Seal the mouth because the mouth has lied for too long. It's spoken wrong for too long. Allah will seal it. The two lips will become like one skin, just like the softness of your cheek. وَتُكَلِّمُنَا أَيْدِيهِمْ And Allah will command the hands to speak. وَتَشْهَدُ أَرْجُلُهُمْ مِمَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ And their feet will testify against him. Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi alayhi, after quoting this ayah, he, uh, this ayah is from Surah um, Yasin. Then after that, Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi alayhi, says, so be very careful to protect your body. In particular, seven limbs of yours. Because the hellfire has seven doors. And there are a set group of people who will enter through each door. He says that hellfire has seven doors. And there are seven major limbs that we use to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So watch very carefully on how you interact with these limbs. Only those people will enter into in through those eight those seven doors who have disobeyed Allah with these seven limbs. Wahia and those seven limbs are Al Ainu Wal Udunu Wal Lisanu Wal Batanu Wal Farju Wal Yadu Wal Riju. He says those seven limbs are Al Ainu the eye. وَالْأُذْنُ the ear وَالْلِسَانُ the tongue وَالْبَطَنُ the stomach وَالْفَرْجُ the private area وَالْيَدُ the hand وَالْرِجْلُ and the foot and then after going through that he starts listing each of those seven and the way he constructs his discussion is so beautiful because it really is a tear-jerking chapter to read it makes you cry because he starts off by saying as for the eye Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave it to you so you can Reflect on His creation. Allah gave it to you so you can read the Qur'an. Allah gave you this eye so you can see the beautiful smile of your kids and see the beautiful smile of your parents. But after Allah gave it to you for all these good things, what did you end up using it in? And then he kind of lays the hammer down. Imam Ghazali, he does that a lot. He'll lay the hammer down and say, this is what you used it in. When he comes to the tongue, he says, فَإِنَّمَا خُلِقَ لَكَ لِتُكْثِرَ بِهِ ذِكْرَ اللَّهِ 
If you ask me why Allah gave you the tongue, Allah gave you the tongue so you can use it and honor yourself by engaging in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa tilawata kitabihi, so you may read the book of Allah. Wa turshida bihi khalq Allah ila tariqihi, so you may guide people towards right, to, towards the right path. Mankind around you is misguided. People don't see what's right and what's wrong. You know, people when they look at Muslims, they look at Muslims with an eye of hate. Muslims when they look at Muslims, they look at each other with an eye of hate. We have to use our tongue to teach that hate is meaningless, it has no value. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants the creation to love one another, regardless of your, your race, your religion, what your background is. You know, my kids, they, they, they fight in jiu-jitsu. They go to jiu-jitsu, I take them twice a week. Sometimes I'll take them, sometimes my wife will take them. One of the days I was taking my kids to jiu-jitsu and I met this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this man, uh, this, uh, this Caucasian white guy at the, at the gym and we were talking, having a good discussion back and forth. And then he was, he, I, I don't know, somehow it came up. He asked me what I did and I said, well, I was an imam. And he asked me if I had any lectures and I said, hey, I give a lecture every Wednesday at the Carrollton Mosque. And this we're meeting, by the way, in Coppell, which is around the corner from here. So he said to me, okay. So before I knew it, one day he comes to me in the gym and he said to me, I listen to every one of your lectures. He's a non-Muslim Christian. He actually said to me, I listen to every one of your lectures. This week when I dropped my kids off, he said to me, hey, I listened to your lecture on what Islam's ruling is on apostasy and what Islam says about um, the death penalty. And I thought it was really awesome. Like I thought Islam's perspective was really mature. I love the way you were honest and Train your religion. I would love for your voice to reach the congregation, the people that I'm connected with. You know, I would like for you to have a discussion with our pastor and our community. And the truth is that this message that I'm sharing isn't restricted to a scholar. This is a responsibility upon every single Muslim that we use this tongue that God gave us, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us for good, not for evil. He then says, وَتُظْهِرَ بِهِ مَا فِي ضَمِيرِكَ مِنْ حَاجَاتِ دِينِكَ وَدُنْيَاكَ The reason why Allah gave you a tongue is so you can express your worldly needs to people and to Allah, and so that you may express your needs of the hereafter to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, وَإِذَا إِسْتَعْمَلْتَهُ إِسْتَعْمَلْتَهُ لِغَيْرِ مَا خُلِقَ لَكَ فَقَدْ كَفَرْتَ بِنِعْمَةِ اللَّهِ And when you use your tongue for a purpose other than why it was created, you have been ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَهُوَ أَغْلَبُ أَعْضَائِكَ عَلَيْكَ And your tongue will be the one limb of yours that will surely overcome you. وَعَلَى سَائِرِ الْخَلْقِ And not only will it overcome you, your tongue has the power to overcome all of creation. وَلَا يَكُبُّ النَّاسِ فِي النَّارِ عَلَى مَنَاخِرِهِمْ إِلَّا حَصَائِدَ أَلْسِنَتِهِمْ And people are thrown to the pits of the fire of hell, face down, due to the harvesting of their tongues. This is, he is making a reference to the hadith of Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu. Then Imam Ghazali alayhi, says, so protect your tongue from eight diseases. And I'll share them with you. But before I share them with you, I want, I, I want you guys to just stop taking notes for a moment and just sh join me for a quick reflection. I'm going to list eight things right now and I want you to ask yourself, do you find these eight things to be common diseases within your circle? within your friends, on your social media? Do you see these things happening on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram? Do you see these diseases when you interact with your friends, when you're playing basketball with them, maybe when you're going out to the movies? Or do you see these diseases with your friends when you're at work? Do you see these diseases with your family members when everyone gathers together for a big dinner and everyone's sitting together? What are these diseases? Lying. Do we see that today? <laughs> False promises. It's everywhere. Backbiting. There isn't even a funeral that people don't gather together and backbiting. Debating and argumentation. Welcome to Facebook. Self-praise. Welcome to Snapchat and Instagram. Cursing the comment section and YouTube area. Making dua against the creation of Allah. Everywhere. Everyone's always saying, damn you and damn this and damn that. Everyone's praying against one another. And excessive joking and mockering to the point where it's no longer desirable. Just bullying people through your words. These are things that we see all the time. The truth is that if you were to go on social media and categorize the posts on there that you see, 
it's very likely that every one of the posts that you interact with on your social media will fall into one of these eight categories. What's interesting is that Imam Ghazali listed these eight categories roughly 900 to 1,000 years ago. These are problems he faced in his community. And 1,000 years later, 900 years later, we face the very same problems. The world doesn't move on. We have the very same roots in us. The way we communicate these problems may change. So what are these eight diseases? The first thing he says, lying. It always starts as a joke. I was lying, I was joking. What do kids say when you bust them lying? I was joking. I didn't really mean it. And then they flip it on you. Some of the adults, they're smart. They'll flip it on you. It's your fault you took it seriously. I didn't mean I was going to give you $1,000. Which fool would give you $1,000? If you want to know how bad lying is, Imam Ghazali uses this reflection quite regularly. He says, if you want to know how bad any spiritual disease is, the best thing is to ask yourself how bad it is when someone does it to you. How do you feel when someone lies to you? If your wife outright lied to you, or if your husband outright lied to you, how would you feel? If you would be offended and if you wouldn't like it, maybe once or twice it might be cute, ha ha, laugh it off. But if, you be, if it became perpetual, and if it became a habit of communication, where people were constantly lying to you, how would you feel about it? Without any doubt, you would feel betrayed. You'd feel disgusted that people can't share their thoughts with you honestly. That's exactly how others feel when you lie to them too. Then the second thing Imam Ghazali says, false promises. Now this is when you make a promise and right from the get-go you have no intention of fulfilling it. Someone says to you, Hey Sheikh, will you please come and speak at my son's nikah? And what do you say? Yes, I'll be there. And what are you in your mind? Being? He's going back to nikah. A lot of time, example. Or someone says to you, Hey, I want everyone to be at my party at 7 o'clock sharp. In your mind you say, and you say to that person with your tongue, I'll be there. In your mind, what are you thinking? Nobody's going there before 8 o'clock. You said, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. From 7 o'clock, I was thinking 8 o'clock. The brother made a suggestion of 10 o'clock. Yeah, after everything's over. So people, they, they're not sincere making their promises. Now, one thing is that. The other thing is that you told someone that I'll be there if Jumma'a Salah at 1.30. You're making every effort to come there at 1.30 and then what happens? You get caught on 35. Right? There's always traffic on that highway. So you're, you get caught on, you're in Chicago, you get caught on 94. You're in New York and you get caught on one of the bridges and everybody knows you're going to get stuck. Now, even though you were trying your best, you got stuck and therefore you had to break your promise or there was a compromise in your promise. That's not what this is talking about. The Prophet, peace be upon him, when he says that it's a sign of a hypocrite to make a promise and go against it, that's when you make a promise and right from that moment you have no intention of fulfilling or keeping that promise. The third thing is backbiting. Now keep in mind, backbiting is when, you, is when what you are saying is true. If what you're saying about another person is true and you're saying it in their absence, we call this backbiting. The Qur'an compares that to eating the flesh of a dead animal. A very nasty, horrible thing to do. You wouldn't do it in private, you wouldn't do it in public, you shouldn't do it at all. Okay? <clears throat> now what if what you're saying about that person isn't true? Is that still backbiting? Yes or no? That's backbiting plus slandering. It's a double sin. That's a double whammy right there. Not only is it a sin, but it's a double sin. You are a common vice. Exposing other people's faults. Ask yourself, how would you feel? Do you have flaws? Imam Ghazali asked this question actually. He says, do you have flaws? Imam Ghazali says, if you say no, You've been deluded by shaitan. What did Imam Ghazali say? If you say you don't have any flaws, shaitan has just lied to you. The devil has lied to you. If you say yes, you have flaws, then the second question I have is, would you like for anyone to expose them? Yes or no? Absolutely not. And if they did come to you first, before exposing them, if they came to you, would you not provide a hundred reasons why you made that mistake? Yes or no? You would provide a hundred reasons. So why not do that person a favor, save yourself the drive, and just provide a hundred reasons for that person too? Don't backbite at all. Just give that person reasoning. Maybe the reason why, you know, there was one shift who, um, 
somehow there was this website, I don't want to talk too much about it, but there was a website, it's an interesting case, there was a website, and it was like a extramarital dating website, where people who were stepping out on their marriages would make accounts there, and the profiles of those who had accounts on that website were leaked. It happened to be that there was an imam who had a profile. So when everyone heard that there was a, a Muslim scholar who had a profile on that website, what happened to all of them? What did they start thinking? Toba, Mulvi Saab. Nadi, Nadi, what's this guy up to? Right? He's doing a lot of musty. Musty and the busty. Something's going on here. People start th- saying stuff. Now what happened was, no one cared to give that guy the benefit of the doubt. Now I want to ask you guys one thing. Imagine your name popped out on that list. What would you say? Let's say you're guilty. Let's say you're guilty, okay? Absolutely guilty. What would you say if someone came to you? Someone comes to you and says, Hey, your name was on that list. You know in your heart you were guilty, but what would you say to that person? None of your business? That's amazing. What else? Someone else made it. Someone else made it. You would use these arguments, right? In your mind, you would be thinking these are very acceptable arguments. No one had the heart to go and ask that person, what's the story behind this? Just online, there were blogs and Facebook posts. Do you guys remember this? There were battles and arguments going back and forth. This was one or two years ago. Everyone was talking about it everywhere. Oh, this person's name was on Ashley Madison and blah, blah, blah. They kept talking about it. Until finally, that scholar, he had a few, lucky he had some good friends who gave the time. He asked them to look into how his name came up. So he had a few guys who were tech savvy. They went around, did a little digging, and they found out that the account was made, he lives in, he lives in a, he, the account was made in a whole different continent. Not even made in the continent that he lives in. Where was the account, where did it originate from? Not, all, not, not the next city over, not the next bed over, not the, the floor above or the bottom. It was made in a whole different continent. And, he, and this is how uh, Shaitan made it muzayyan, beautified it for the eyes of the people, and nobody cared to give this person the benefit of the doubt. That's that's also another thing. That's also another thing that you don't go around spying on other people, going underneath and doing digging. But at the same time, Imam Ghazali's reflection. Let's come back to this, okay? If you had a flaw and someone knew it, would you want them to share it with other people? If they shared it, most likely you're the one who gave them that information, which means you must have given it in trust. Or maybe they received it through a pathway where you gave your trust. Ultimately, if someone in that chain betrayed your trust, how would you feel about that person? Possibly never speak to that person again. Break the hearts of two people. If backbiting comes common, society breaks. It's like the break of the credit system, the organic credit system that human beings have. Husnul that's what Sharia wants for every human being to have good thought of another. It completely breaks down. Then the, um, the next thing that he's... And also backbiting, indirectly, Imam Ghazali says, entails self-praise. You're praising yourself. That, you know, I'm so, mashallah, so hardcore, and that person is so haram, astaghfirullah. Like, you know, that person's involved in all these bad things. Luckily, I'm not. So he said it's a very hidden, subtle self-praise involved as well. And then debate in argumentation. People learn through sincerity. People learn through advice. Very few people learn anything when it comes to debate. When debates are get inv- when people get involved in debates, you know, your emotions fly all over the place, rage kicks in, and you're no longer interested in listening to what another person has to say. Debate and argumentation has its place, but it's kind of like the last resort of da'wah. It's not the first place where you start. There was this big thing back in the day where people would put up tables on busy streets on the weekends. You guys remember that? And pass up flyers and start debating with everyone. That's not how you teach Islam to people. You don't debate and argue with people. Teach them through your actions. Teach them softly. Number five, self-praise. Someone asked a, a wise man, what's a dirty truth? What's the truth but at the same time dirty? Filthy. So he said, a man praising himself. Even though what he's saying may be true, but the act is very dirty, it's very filthy. Because you shouldn't have to stand there and say, hey people, this is what I've accomplished in life. If you're introducing yourself where an introduction is needed, that's another thing. But just going to every gathering and making it very clear, guys, you're walking around with your stethoscope, your, your scope around your neck. Guys, this is me right here. Dr. Saab, check it out. That's me. Right. Or you're walking around with a big patch on your shoulder saying, Sheikh Fulan, Fulan ibn Fulan. 
that this is scholar so and so and so. The scholars of the past, and even the masters of the past, no matter which science it was, they hid themselves. Do you guys know that? They didn't want anyone to know. They were young people, sitting with young people, teaching them Islam. It was their students that gave them exposure. Otherwise, if, they, if it was their choice, they would just live a, a low profile and die a low profile. Because they didn't want accountability. With more exposure, there comes a lot of accountability. And regarding self-praise, again, let's go back to that good old Ghazali reflection. How annoying is it when you have someone in your gathering who praises himself a lot? If you're driving, for example, on a, on, a, on a road trip, you're going from here to Florida, you have 15 hours together, and there's a guy in the car who's just really full of himself. He always wants to talk about him, his accomplishments. What do you tell your buddy next to you, halfway through the drive or five minutes into the drive? Where's the next gas station? We're dropping this guy off. He can catch the Greyhound. He's not coming with us anymore. I can't handle this guy. It's glass on my ears. Glass, glass punching. We like it. So if you don't like listening to people overly praising themselves, then how do you think the world feels when you keep saying, I'm this, I'm that, I'm this, I'm that? Relax. Number six, cursing lana. Cursing isn't something necessary. It's an option. It's something that's permissible if you are oppressed. If you never cursed shaitan your entire life even once, Allah wouldn't ask you about it on the Day of Judgment. There is no obligation on even cursing shaitan. And if the devil himself, who's done so much wrong to all of mankind, if he isn't obligated to curse, then everyone else can be forgiven too. Right? And the sixth thing is, seventh thing is making dua against the creation of Allah. And the eighth thing is excessive joking and mockery. Excessive joking, always laughing and joking, takes away from you the seriousness of life, kills your heart, makes it dead. And when you joke and, mo and engage in too much mockery, you end up preying on the weak in the gathering and you become an ultimate bully. That's what this commonly leads to. There might be a person who has decency and they may not have the, uh, the personality to respond every time. Some people, they'll respond. Others, they'll stay quiet. So what do these people do? They're like vultures. They search for the weak people in the gathering, they latch onto them and they keep eating their flesh. They keep mocking them, keep making fun of them. And that person, maybe because he's beloved to Allah and has a soft nature, won't say anything. And this person, maybe because he has a harsh nature, harsh nature, harsh nature, and is disliked by Allah, that he will lose all of his reward in the process. Uh, the seventh point was making dua against the creation of Allah. That was the seventh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, مَا يَلْفِذُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ إِلَّا لَدَيْهِ رَقِيبٌ عَتِيدٌ that there is not a word that is uttered, but it is noted down. And they are waiting to, no, to note it down. In the sama'a wal basara wal fu'ad, kullu ula'ika kana anhu mas'ula. The hearing, the sight, and the heart, all of it will be, will be questionable by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the scholar is different in opinion when discussing this ayah. Allah says all of our deeds are written down. There is a deed on the right, there is an angel on the right who writes the good deeds, and there is an angel on the left who writes the bad deeds that we do. The question is, which of our statements do they write? Which of our statements do they not write? There are two opinions on the issue. وَاخْتَلَفَ السَّلَفُ وَالْعُلَمَاءُ فِي أَنَّهُ هَلْ يُكْتَبُ جَمِيعُ مَا يَلْفِذُ بِهِ الْعَبْدِ There's a difference of opinion amongst the scholars whether everything that is stated is actually written or not. Imam Nabi Rahmatullahi Alayhi has a lengthy discussion in his Sharh on Sahih Muslim and this is an excerpt from that. He says, if what the person says has no sin or reward attached to it, meaning it's kalam mubah. For example, someone just sneezes. Just the noise of sneezing itself, the action of sneezing itself, or the action of chewing, or the action of blinking. There's no reward or sin attached to it. So Ibn Abbas and other scholars, they hold the opinion that these are things that are not written down. However, other scholars, they say, everything is noted down. Whether you sneeze, whether you blink, and everything, it's all noted down. <coughs> Ibn Abbas says, as narrated by Imam Qastallani in his Irshad al-Sari, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the angels write down every good and bad thing we do. And tomorrow on the Day of Judgment, you will see in your book of deeds what food you had, what drink you had, where you went, where you came from, what you saw. And then every Thursday, 
those deeds are sent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're sent up. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then sees all of the deeds. Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is fully aware of those deeds. But as what is described by the angels, it's sent forth. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees the good that this person did and the bad that this person did. And then he quotes, يَمْحُ اللَّهُ مَا يَشَاءُ وَيُثْبِتْ وَعِنْدَهُ أُمُّ الْكِتَابِ Surah Ra'ad, verse number 39. Hassan al-Basri rahmatullahi alayhi, he recited the ayah, عَنِ الْيَمِينِ وَعَنِ الشِّمَاءِ لِقَعِيدِ That there is someone sitting on the right and left noting down the deeds. Surah Qaf, ayah number 17. And then he says, O son of Adam, Ibn Hassan al-Basri says, O son of Adam, Ya ibn Adam, your book of deeds will be presented in front of you. There are two angels today who are honorable. They have no desire to sin. They're angels. They're kariman. They're honorable angels who are writing your deeds. An yaminika wal akhir an shimalik. Faman ladi an yaminik fayahfidu hasanatik. As for the one on your right, he records your good, and the one on your left, he records your evil. So he says that these are angels that are by your side. And they are writing down, they have no bias against you, they have no ill intention against you, they are simply noting down what you're doing. And what they are noting down today, when you die, it will be hung, إِذَا مِتَّ تُوِيَتْ صَحِيفَتُكْ وَجُعِيلَتْ فِي عُنُخِكْ Your papers, your scribe, your, your um, deeds will be all wrapped up and wrapped around your neck. And they will be with you in your grave until you exit your grave and come to Allah on the Day of Judgment. فَعِنْدَ ذَلِكَ يَقُولُ وَكُلُّ إِنسَانٍ أَلْزَمْنَاهُ طَائِرَهُ فِي عُنُقِهِ And you will be reminded as Allah says in the Qur'an that every person will be carrying their, their, their doings around their own neck. So Imam Hassan al-Basri says these will be your good deeds. وَنُخْرِجُ لَهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ كِتَابٍ يَلْقَاهُ مَنْشُورًا اِقْرَأْ كِتَابَكَ Allah will then open up that book around your deeds and say اِقْرَأْ كِتَابَكَ Read your own book. كَفَى بِنَفْسِكَ الْيَوْمَ عَلَيْكَ حَسِيبًا Because today you will suffice as an encounter against yourself. You will hold yourself accountable. There's no need for anyone else. So then he says, عَدَلَ Hassan al-Basri says, عَدَلَ وَاللَّهِ مَنْ جَعَلَكَ حَسِيبًا نَفْسِكَ He says, the, indeed Allah was just because He is making you accountable over your own deeds. You can't even deny your own actions. If someone else was accounting you, you would say the IRS was oppressive to me, they had a bias against me. But here you are accountable to yourself. Who are you going to lie to? And where are you going to turn? There are many narrations from the companions, from the scholars of the past, and the Prophet ﷺ regarding the tongue itself. I'll share a few of you with you. I'll share a few with you. The first is from Ibn, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. He says, there is nothing in the world that is more deserving to be imprisoned for long periods than the tongue. You should imprison your tongue in your mouth and not let it out. Some scholars would say, al-lisanu hayyatun wa maskanuha al-fam, that the tongue is a snake. And its hole is the mouth. Keep its hole shut, otherwise it'll bite someone. Sahar ibn Sa'd narrates from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, مَن يَمَّنْ لِي مَا بَيْنَ لِحْيَيْهِ وَمَا بَيْنَ لِجِلَيْهِ أَضْمَنْ لَهُ الْجَنَّةِ whoever, gar- whoever guarantees me safety and security of what lies between the jaws and what lies between the legs, meaning the private area. Whoever can secure these two, abstinence, I promise that person paradise, the Prophet Muhammad said. Imam Tirmidhi rahmatullahi alayhi narrates a narration from Ibn Umar radiallahu an who narrates it from the Prophet of Allah, one of my favorite narrations. The Prophet of Allah said, لَا تُكْثِرُ كَلَامَ بِغَيْرِ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّ كَثْرَةَ الْكَلَامَ بِغَيْرِ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ يُقَصِّ الْقَلْبِ وَإِنَّ بَعَضَ النَّاسِ عَنِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى الْقَلْبُ الْقَاسِ That don't speak abundantly other than the remembrance of Allah. Keep yourself engaged in the remembrance of Allah. For indeed, abundance of speech without being thankful, grateful, remembering Allah hardens the heart. And the one who refers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment will be the one who has a hard heart. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, the first successor of the Prophet of Allah, the first believer in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the closest companion of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, he would point at his tongue, يَأْخُذُ بِلِسَانِهِ He would hold his tongue, وَيَقُولُ هَذَا أَوْرَدَنِي الْمَوَارِدِ that this tongue of mine has got me in a lot of trouble. Who's saying this by the way? A person who the Prophet called a siddiq The Prophet himself said this man is truthful. He is known as a siddiq If I said a siddiq I know everyone in this gathering who is a Muslim would know I'm talking about who? Abu Bakr. 
He is holding his tongue as saying, You've caused me a lot of pain and trouble in life. Allahu Akbar. Wahhab ibn Munabbih says, أَجْمَعَتِ الْحُكَمَاءَ عَلَىٰ أَنَّ رَأْسَ الْحُكْمِ الصمت. The wise people have unanimously agreed that wisdom comes, wisdom comes from silence. Omar bin Abdul Aziz was one day giving a lecture. فَرَقَّ nas. During his lecture, the people, they became very soft, meaning they started crying, their hearts became soft. The nature of his speech was heart-touching. فَقَطَعَ خُطْبَتَهُ He then stopped giving the khutbah. Everyone was in tears, he was emotional himself. So someone came to him and said, someone came to him said, لَوْ أَتْمَمْتَ كَلَامِكْ رَجَوْنَا أَنْ يَنْفَعَ اللَّهُ بِهِ Why don't you finish off your lecture? We have hope that Allah will bring benefit from your words. فَقَالَ Umar, Umar bin Abdul Aziz then said, إِنَّ الْقَوْلَ فِتْنَةٌ وَالْفِعْلَ أَوْلَى بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ مِنَ الْقَوْلِ He said, speech is a test from Allah. If there's anything that will benefit you, it'll be actions. Because actions have much more value to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than statements. Muhammad bin Ajlan says, إِنَّمَا الْكَلَامُ أَرْبَعَةٌ That if you wish to engage in speech, then be sure to give four things attention. أَن تَذْكُرَ الله. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every morning you wake up, before you touch your phone, promise yourself you'll remember Allah first. Alhamdulillah الذي أحيانا بعد ما أماتنا وإليه النشور Every night before you go to sleep, don't let your Facebook feed be the last thing you read. Right? Don't let it be some video of someone trolling a political figure, you know, in, in a, on, on, on some short uh, clip. Don't let that be the last thing that you see. The last thing, the first thing, your whole day should be the remembrance of Allah, the remembrance of Allah. Make a habit of saying Bismillah every time you unlock your phone. Bismillah rahman rahim Make that habit. If you said that, trust me, you'd, do, you'd be saying Bismillah a lot more than you think. You'll be doing dhikr of Allah quite regularly because we unlock our phones so much. Bismillah, Bismillah, Bismillah. Make a habit of that. The second thing, وَتَقْرَأَ Al-Qur'an. Make a habit of reading the Qur'an. Our tongues in relation to the Qur'an are like barren deserts. By coincidence, we might not read an ayah of the Qur'an, but we read the Qur'an with the intention of reading the Qur'an. So that our hearts can be nourished. He says, the one who considers his speech actions will not engage in necessary time. Otherwise, until then, on Facebook, we were just ranting away. Okay? Allah rewards Snapchat for restricting us. Otherwise, on Instagram, we were just chatting away, video after video, picture after picture. There was no restriction. Alhamdulillah, now our book of deeds is washed after every 24 hours on Snapchat. Otherwise, before they was never washed. I'd be going through my Facebook sometimes and I'd, and I'd click on the notifications and it would say, someone liked your post. And I tell myself, I haven't posted anything in three weeks. And they liked something, a post that I posted in 2006. I don't know how he found that post. Absolutely shocked. Absolutely shocked. I have no idea how someone found a post that I posted in 2006. And that's the dunya that we live in. That's the world that we live in. Spend your time remembering Allah. If you want to avoid doing bad things, the best thing is to spend more time doing good things. Spend time and pause.